I hope you will join me as we listen to Deed Eman, a leader of the Dutch underground during the Second World War, share one of the most amazing Christian lives that has ever been shared. Her life, the things that she experienced, the way that the Bible comes alive through her experience was a tremendous inspiration to me. And I hope and pray as you listen to Deed's story that you will be encouraged, that you will be inspired, that you will be thrilled about an amazing life that God gave to this woman that I believe has been lived out, not only to bless others during the war, but also to speak to us in this time. Well, 59 years ago, I was arrested, but when I was 18, 19 years old, Hitler occupied whole Europe and he occupied the Netherlands. And we had very many Jewish people because in 15 and 1600, the Jews in Spain and Portugal were all burned. So they fled and they did not go to Germany. They did not go to Austria. They came to the Netherlands because we let everybody who, who works and lives there is okay. So we have always many people from other countries. But then Hitler became the boss and we were occupied. And it was horrible because Hitler had one thing that he hated the Jews. Nobody knew why, but he hated the Jews. And so, and we had so many. And Anne Frank, most people have heard of Anne Frank. She came from Germany to the Netherlands <coughs> because they thought there they were safe. We had not been in a war in so many hundreds of years. And Germany was in many wars and they started it mostly with France. So then we were occupied and then Hitler started to make all his rules in our country. And we have one national thing, and that is maybe sometimes good and sometimes not good, but we are very, the Dutch are very stubborn. <laughs> and we don't like to be told what we can do yes, and what we yes. can't do. So then they started to make all rules. We couldn't go out for curfew and we couldn't do this. And then right away he said, the non-Jews were not allowed to visit Jews or Jews visit others. And you were not allowed into all the synagogues were burned and oh, it was horrible. So they started this fairly soon then, right after they came in, they just started to immediately make the separation between the Jews and, and the non-Jews. And I had Jewish friends. I worked with a guy. So, and he was a friend, he played beautiful violin. And my brother played in an orchestra cello and I played horrible piano, but we had lots <laughs> horrible of fun piano. because okay. we had trios. And yes. Herman came often, and then all of a sudden he wasn't allowed to come anymore. And we said to him, the heck with Hitler, you come? He said, no, I don't dare to. So that was the first thing. And then they, Hitler started in the Netherlands on the Jews. And then uh, one time Herman, he didn't dare to come to our house. He wasn't allowed to go in many streets where there were, let's say, and uh, there were so many rules against the Jewish people. So when they, he phoned me, he said, Deed, I want to see you. And we only meet in the street where he was allowed to. And on mm -hmm. our bikes we met. And he showed me a letter. And it was, now if you think that those Jewish people were there from 15, 1600, they had the right, right. to be in the Netherlands. Right. They were for centuries. Right. The family was there. His father was a lawyer. They are mostly, they loved to study. They were lawyers, doctors. And mm -hmm. so, and all of a sudden, all the Jewish people, and they had lists because in the town halls was always at the time also your, where you were born and whatever, but the religion was also. So they had all of this information. They had, they had, had collected all of this, the everything. In every yeah. city and every yeah. village. Yeah. So then he said, Deed, he says, we got this letter and he showed me. And it said that during the curfew, he, they had to report at railroad stations. And they were only allowed to leave everything behind, except they were take, allowed to take a change of clothing, a fork, a knife, a spoon, and a cup, and a blanket. And that's it? And that was it, in a hand that they could carry. Now, just think, yeah. I mean, in our family, there are heirlooms that goes from... Yeah, right, all the family yeah, stuff just had to drop everything, everything and go. Everything had to leave yeah. behind. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, I thought, that is terrible. They have, what, what was their crime? Mm -hmm. This is that you, it's a crime. You, they are treated as a crime. 
and that crime was that they were Jewish. Yes. And let's face it, Jesus was a Jew. Right, our Lord is a Jew, absolutely. And also, yeah. if the Jewish people believe him, yes or no, in Jesus, but they were God's chosen people. That's right, the chosen people. And so then we felt that we had to do that and help them. As human beings, I think we're all uh, somewhat naive about evil when it comes our way. And in this story, Diet Eman shares her life and how evil really surprised the people of the Netherlands as Adolf Hitler and his plans for the Third Reich came into the Netherlands. I talked to my fiancé, Hein. He said, Diet, I forgot the book that Hitler wrote. It was called Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf, yes. And he said, he's going to do something terrible with them. But we had no idea. Now, now this is an interesting thing too, Diet, because he had read the book, and, and of course in Mein Kampf there was really discussion of all of these things, and you kind of wonder why didn't people believe what he wrote in the book? You know, because he didn't. said many of the things that he ended up doing. Most people didn't even read the yeah, book. Yeah, most people didn't even know what was coming. They didn't even read the book. They yeah, did I not. Know. But the people are blind now also. What is all happening? And I mean, they are blind. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. The majority. Yeah, people today, do you think that the parallels are just the same? People don't realize or, or know what's happening, right? They just no. don't know. And there were also churches that uh, said, it says in the Bible, clearly you have to obey your authorities. So they felt that they had to do what the, what the government, the Germans said, the Nazis. And uh, we felt, and that was another group, and that was really the group that caused the resistance, the Queen. Bill, yes. uh, that was Wilhelmina. Queen Wilhelmina, yes. With the whole government, she had fled to England. Okay. And when we heard that first, we were terrible, sad, and angry, because I've, in the diary of my husband, of, of Hein, he was so angry that a mother doesn't leave right, her. Right, to kid. leave her children behind, you must have felt like orphans, you yeah. know, like you had been abandoned your mother, by yeah. your mother, sure. But then it was so totally different when you, later that it became the whole government left. Yes. And in the Netherlands, the royalty is always crowned by the grace of God. Mm -hmm. So we felt that was our rightful because of that. That's right. That they always were Christians and by the grace of God, so, and the whole government then, so they were in England. And that is why we felt that you could, you had to do resistance. So, because the Queen spoke over the radio, secret radio sender at eight o'clock at night. And then she told, and she also asked, for instance, to go on strike for Amsterdam. And she told us what we should do. So we felt that was our rightful government. Yes. And that is how the resistance came. Yeah, so the Queen actually went to England and then she began broadcasting from England, secret broadcasts that were going across and Every, you would listen to them in the Netherlands. Now, did the Nazis, did they, did they forbid this? Yeah, I mean, you went to jail if you so, were caught. So in other words, if you were caught listening to the radio, you'd go off to jail, yes. Because when we had it on, then there was no TV. If you had the radio on, then it was very soft and you sat like that. And then always one of the family walked outside, walked the door, because everywhere was the Gestapo, the Geheime Staatspolizei, the secret police. The secret police. And they uh -huh. walked, and they could, of course, in the curfew and so, but they walked through the streets, and if they heard the radio, the radio was forbidden, yeah. or German. So then that was really, uh, but that's why we felt we had to obey the Queen. Yeah, you had because to obey she the was queen. our rightful government. The rightful government, and that's yeah. how the resistance came. Now, early on, did you start to see Jewish people that you knew? Did they start to just disappear, or no, what when, started happening? Well, um, what happened is that Herman told me that they had had that paper and that they had to leave, and I told Hein, and he said no. He said I read that book of Hitler. He's going to do something terrible with them. We, d we didn't expect even killing, but yeah. I mean, to leave your house when you have with everything behind, that's right. a horrible thing. So then uh, we have to do something. And we told Herman, and Hein said, you know what? I know all those farmers there because the food was such a problem. The Germans took everything out and we had ration cards. You okay. only could get a so bread. That, that's, you one had of, that's one of the ration yeah. cards there? Okay. Bread and then you went with your money and the coupon and often there was no bread, it was all in Germany. So was, was just yeah. about everything that you, you got, was it rationed? I mean, you had bread and all of the things, were they all rationed yeah. pretty much the same? Yes? 
and they, we were hiding. At, we started with Herman, and it's so just Herman a, was actually the first person Herman that was, you hit, and you worked with him in the bank. Yeah. So he was the very first person. He I mean, the, he's always a very special person in your life. But he was a little bit scared. Yeah. But then his sister, Rosa, she says, oh, I want to go right away. She was the first one. Yeah. And then he had a girlfriend and his parents, they said, oh, it won't be so bad. We go, we'll go and they make us work and we come back. Three months later, they were dead in oh, Sobibor, we found out after Three months war. later, they were dead. Herman's parents, yeah. Now, Sobibor was a, a concentration camp. That was camp. a horrible concentration. Now, that was in, in the Netherlands? or where? That was in Germany. In Germany. On the so, both Polish border. And okay. they tried to hide it even at the end of the war. They tried to erase the whole thing. But some people had escaped, and they said they found so many bones and skulls and things there. Right. So Bibor was really an extermination camp. So it's really horrible. What really happened is the Lord showed you a need. You saw what was happening, and you said to me a minute ago that if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, how could you not help these people? Yes? That's how I felt and how Hein felt and several of our friends, but not everybody. Yeah. Because, you know, when there is danger, because it was dangerous, of yeah. course, to start hiding them because the Germans were everywhere. But we had to do it because yeah. you so, can't stand by. Yeah, can't and stand by and just watch this happen. Of Jesus, also all the disciples, really, except for Peter and Peter and, uh, and John. John yes. lived long to write a book. That's but right. all the others, the ten, had horrible death. Yeah. James was sawn in two. So, I mean, you can't say, I don't do it. You have to do what God put on your path. So you really knew as a young woman when this was happening that there was a risk and you were willing to do it because you felt the disciples and the Lord's people should be willing to suffer. Yes? You have to. You have to be willing to do God that. God has never promised that our lives will be easy from the moment we are born till the moment we yeah. die. So he put things on your path and I think also that is also that you got closer to him. Yeah, you get closer to the Lord. Now, Dee, did you have anybody, your friends or girlfriends or people saying things to you like, Dee, don't get involved, don't do this. No. Did you have people coming to you and talking to you that way? Yes? And for my parents, it was hard because with the curfew and when we had to do the robberies, we had false papers that you had a permit and they didn't know and often I didn't come home till midnight or so. And uh, they asked, he said, Deed, what's going on? And we are so worried. I said, Mom and Dad, it's better that you don't know, but just pray. And then later they said they had calluses on their <laughs> knees. <laughs> calluses me. on their it's, knees praying for you. So your mom and dad, they, they didn't know everything that was going on. I didn't know, no. You they, just made sure you didn't tell them because you, they could have been arrested and tortured. Because the Gestapo or, came and they interrogated them. And if they start torturing, you never know what you say. We, you never in that time wanted to know what the other one did. Yeah. You did just your part and you didn't want to know because many were arrested. And I know one guy who did so much, he was a spy and they did the most horrible things if they thought you know something and you don't say it. For instance, I have still a few things from that time. They started pulling your nails. They what? They started hand. pulling off and your then fingernails? Your toes. Now, I thought, oh Lord, if they ever do that to me with the second nail, I'll tell everything I know yeah. and then I want to die. One of the amazing things about Deed Eamon's life, a leader of the Dutch resistance movement during the Second World War, is how her love for people grew and grew to involving hundreds of people throughout the country. So as the underground was growing, eventually it got more sophisticated, right? You eventually had a bigger network of people. And then I think you were starting to go into a thing where you were putting Jewish people out into the countryside, right? Always the farmers. So you always would go out and try to take people from the cities and kind of move them to the country. So how did you find these farmers? Who, who would find them for you? Well, like Hein's father. Okay, his father, yes. Was the principal of a Christian school. Mm -hmm. So he knew all the farmers there because okay. they were 10 kids and all the farmers, it was a very, you have sections in the Netherlands of be, be above the river, let's go on, that was mostly Protestant Christian and South Catholic, but the Catholics did it too, but not so much. But the person really did it out of conviction. 
and he knew so many of those farmers. Yeah, so, so Hein and his father knew all of this network of people and you were able to begin to place the people. Well, his father was also against it, so we oh, had Oh, he to, was yeah, against it? He was kind of scared because, uh, but anyway, we did, he knew all those farmers, so we went there. And then they said, uh, do, you, he, I, do you know others where we can bring men? And we had always to have a few reserve if a place was dangerous because those Jews had to stay inside. At that time, it was all families. If here was a farmer and his wife and he had yes. seven kids, the seven kids got all farms okay. close by. So okay. it was not that you, like now, that you do travel so much. Okay. But if there was all of a sudden a stranger, he what is that? And, uh, and they started writing each other. Yes, yes. And that was dangerous, so yeah. we had to forbid So you just that. had to be very careful. And so you had all of these people now, Deet, in the countryside. And they were staying with families that were largely farmers. And then you had to begin to get the food, right, to be able to start feeding them. So, so what started to happen? Because you had to get, what, the ration cards? Is well, that right? We had, we had so many. And in the end, we had to also hide them in the cities. And that was the problem, because in the city, farmers can always grow something. Okay, so there's but, something. The farmers were basically okay, but it was more the ration in cards the city, were for in the city. And there was yeah. that old, that lady, she was 50, Mies, and. I was asked to go to that address and they said they won't let you in. They have a code word, a secret uh, entrance. So they gave us that code word and they said they need help. So I went, it was on the second floor in The Hague in a busy street and it was a small apartment for one person, like yes. you have here also, a bedroom, a, a sitting room, a kitchenette and a big closet and a toilet with a shower and a hall. And that, that and was a little, said, just a little apartment. It yeah. was a little, on the second floor in a busy street, in the heart of The Hague. So they said, go there, they need help, and it's dangerous. So they won't open the door, they gave me the password, so I went there, and I was kind of scared. So I rang the bell, and then a voice came, do you know? Uh, the, uh, the, so I said the password, and they opened. And it was a lady, 50 years old, me. She had... 27 what? Jews in that one place. 27, 27. people? 27. I mean, were they literally standing I, up to next to each other? I mean, 27 people. I, in one small apartment, yeah. I said, how do you do that? And I was scared. I said, you will. And the worst was that while we were talking, that was all apartments. I hear that next door, they turn, they flush the toilet. Yes. So I said to her, do you hear that? She said, yes. She did not see the danger. She, she didn't realize what She had what a we, golden yeah. heart. And I said, do you hear that? She said, yes. I said, now, when you, how long did you live here? Eight years. All along, yes. I said, now you have 28 people who go to the bathroom and flush. If next, do you know if they are Nazis? We don't know. <laughs> I said, well, that's very dangerous because yes. If they are Nazis, then they wonder why that thing yeah, flushes sure. so many times. That's right. I said, and they, he, she let them phone and do everything. I said, strict rules. I will bring you every month 27 ration cards, but you have to follow the rules. So and you had to go off and get the ration cards yeah, she what, every ration. month? Is it once a month? Did you have these once a month? They were, yeah, that was the thing. We needed them every month. And they were only just, they lasted a month, three days or four days before we had a new one, they were brought in by the government in every village and city. So we had to do the robberies on those three days that they were there. So just as they were coming into the, to the offices around those two or yeah. three days, you would have to break into the office? Well, we, how, did you, how did you get in there? Well, that was the interesting. We always took cities and villages where we knew somebody who worked there. Oh, okay. And when the Germans were in charge of all those offices, and the people wanted to quit, and the, the Germans said, no, you stay there, but they were under the Germans. So that was our blessing that all the Dutch people were still, they weren't okay, allowed to Okay, so they left quit. the Dutch in charge, so and you could get them from to, your friends. And then we tied the guys up, and we bound them, and then we... They told us where the carts were, so we took the carts. <laughs> so you had, you had to actually tie these people up, right? Well, yes, because yeah. the next day the Gestapo came, and all those paper, uh, those rations have disappeared. Right, you had to show them that they that weren't the ones that had done That guy would be arrested. It. That's right. So, but exactly. he had helped us. So then we tied him up, and that he said, yeah, I couldn't do a thing. They came, and they tied okay. me up, and they took So it. you actually saved these people's lives by tying them up and protecting yeah, them, because the Nazis would have, would have taken yeah. them maybe in 
and executed them or shot them or something. But it was a blessing that they weren't allowed to quit. We needed them. We needed yeah. the couch. There was nothing anymore. The last winter in Amsterdam and Rotterdam, they ate cats and dogs. Cats and dogs. There was no food anymore. Yeah. And that's, we needed it for the people who were in hiding. So then, <laughs> always, I always laugh now, but uh, because in, in Germany they made a film and it was so funny because we first went on our knees and we prayed and we said, yeah. Lord, will you please give that our robbery goes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Lord, bless our thieves. Right, bless so the thieves. first we asked yeah. for a blessing and then we did the robbery. You did the robbery. And I think now there are many <laughs> robberies, but they don't think to pray first. Yeah, yeah. But so you actually had a responsibility to support a lot of people. And so every month you had to get those cards. We had okay. about 200 and our group Two, needed 200, made, you had 200 ration we cards a month. everything and okay. we helped other groups. Okay. So you were kind of at the center of this, and then they would go out all over the Netherlands, right? These, these ration cards and stuff in different places so people could eat. Yeah. And while they were doing the robbery, there was, of course, uh, you had to put, I was one of the guards often, that you had to let them know if, if there was any Gestapo thing. Well, well that happened. So then was a, there was a little office here where the, where the robbery was, and then, I was at this road and another there that you gave a signal and I stood well to tell them that the Gestapo was coming or something. It was... What, what was it like for, I mean, you were around 20 years old, 20, what was it like for a 20, were you just sitting there afraid, were you nervous, what were you feeling when you were in these robberies? No, I was so furious that they came into our country. So you're just mad. That, yeah, I was mad. <laughs> okay. I think that drove mad. me a lot. Yeah. And also knowing that it was very wrong that they were after God's people. So I felt that, yeah. no, I was always very, and for years after the war, I didn't want to go to Germany. Yeah. I it. You just had an anger about the way they oh, had done the, your country years. and all of the Jewish people. and. Yeah. But then all of a sudden it dawned on me that I had no right to pray to our Father. Forgive like we forgive those yeah. who trespass against us and they surely trespassed against us. And I thought, if I can't forgive, how can I expect forgiveness from God? Do, do you think that any of the Germans that you met or saw in the Netherlands, do you, do you think they felt guilty? or bad about what they were doing? I mean, some of them were really hard Nazis, but some of the German soldiers, do, do you think they felt that maybe this was wrong, what they were doing? Do, do, did you ever feel that they, they were concerned well, about their behavior? it's very interesting that you ask that because uh, after the war, I was invited to come to Germany, and then really they explained they were forced, they had no choice to go in the Hitler Youth. All the boys. Right, the, the boys were forced to go into the Hitler Youth, old. yes. And like the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. So they mm -hmm. first did all fun things, so they all loved it. But then all the coaches, they were very fanatic Nazis. So they started telling them the Jews had done this and then. Yeah, they started brainwashing these boys. And yeah. by the time they were 17, 18, they were brainwashed. Yeah and the majority, and very few, and the Bible wasn't being read anymore, yes. and the churches were empty, and they, there was nothing, no religious life really anymore. Hitler believed in providence. Now, what is providence? Can be anything. Yeah. So. Well, Hitler also, he really deceived people in making them, I guess, kind of believe that he was a, a spiritual person, that he had a mission for Germany, and I mean, I think he, he got the young people to believe that. You know, that they were really on almost a divine mission, they, really. They did. Yeah. But after the war, I was in Germany, and then I thought, yeah, you see how that happened, that the juice was poisoned. Yes. And that is what all dictatorships do, mm -hmm. in Russia, too, in, uh, years ago. And so those kids were poisoned, and they didn't know, and they followed rules, and they, and, and the German, as a character track. We are stubborn, but they are followers. I, I, you read the history, they follow someone. They were very obedient, yeah. following a leader. So yeah. They followed the leader. But now after the war, and I think that's beautiful, I spoke all over Germany, and I had to speak for a big TV station. And then after that happened, 
many people, they, at TV station that we know that 8 million people listen. 8, eight million, million Germans, Germans were listening to the and thing. And many wrote to the TV station. Yes. And they sent me those letters, and I still have them. They are now in Calvin. No, the government of the Netherlands wanted it. And they asked for forgiveness, what they did. They were asking for forgiveness. Were some of these actual, some of them soldiers that might have been in the Netherlands, or just in general, they, they, they wanted? They asked for forgiveness, and yes. all. And I heard that in 1980, the year 1980, 1980. officially, the government of Germany asked forgiveness to the government of Israel. Did you know it's, that? Yes, it's just remarkable that there was a, really a desire to get reconciliation and to start again. And yes. I was not, I, I went several times to Germany and for years it was compulsory that they told what they had done yeah. in the high schools and in the higher classes of mm -hmm. the, so, and in the universities. So, I think that is kind of beautiful that they don't hide the horrible things they did. Yes. That they really took yes. the responsibility to for it. To take responsibility for it. Because let's face it, the Japanese bombarded Pearl Harbor without mm -hmm. any reason. Right. They never have said they're sorry. No, that's but really true. There hasn't been any really sense of apology. One of the things that made a huge impact to me listening to Deet Eman share was her talking about sharing some of her story in Germany after the Second World War. And I was very moved by hearing her sharing the story of how German people from all over Germany and listening to her on television would write in or would call in and really ask her to forgive them. And really we're looking for reconciliation, we're looking for a sense of God's grace over the things that some of them knew that they had done during the war that were wrong. And it reminded me on the deepest level that God's image, his conscience, his life has been impressed on all of us. And that even during the worst times of human evil and during a world war, that that human conscience is still alive, sensitive to sin, and ultimately at some level is seeking forgiveness and reconciliation. And I think that one of the most moving things I've ever heard is Diet Eman talk about her love relationship with Heinz Sietzma, one of the great stories of love and sacrifice during the Second World War. Let's listen to Diet as she shares this powerful story of the triumph of love. How did you find out about Heinz's death? I mean, did you find out, was it during the war? What happened? How did you find out about that? After the war, uh we were waiting for all the guys who were arrested. So we were waiting for people who came back. And when evening the doorbell rang, and it was the father from a guy who was also in the underground. And he happened to be in the, in the Hague. And he rang the bell and he came. And uh, I said, oh, isn't it wonderful? The war is over and now we wait and Hein comes back. And he was very quiet. And then he says, well, did not everybody will come back. And then he knew he had seen the list and he knew that he came to tell me that Hein had been killed. So He'd I must have made it very mm. difficult for him to yeah. tell, you know, and I, because, oh, Hein is coming back and whatever. And this poor guy came to tell me because his son was also in Dachau and the son came back via, via, via. It was in June and the war was over in May. So he heard and he came and told, told me that. So Hein lived through most of the war, but just at near the end, he but died. But he told yeah. me also because one of his, I don't know if it was his son, but a close relative had been in the same camp. Yes. And Hein was dragged from one camp to another. He was in the most horrible camp, Neuengamme, that is so famous for being so horrible. Yes. And then I thought, Lord, why did he have to go to all those horrible camps? And I was really angry yes. with God, and uh, that you take his life, but why so horrible? And then I heard from this man that Hein everywhere had told people we are in the m biggest misery about Jesus. So in the midst of so all of it, he talked to people, a missionary among a all Dachau. people who were sentenced to death. Yeah. And, then I, and that he wrote that letter, threw it out, and said, we will never be sorry for what we did. And if we don't see each other here on earth again, we will surely see each other in heaven. As Dee Eman shared the story of her fiance, Hein Sietzma, and how he eventually went to his death trying to save the Jewish people and save others during the Second World at Dachau, I was just overwhelmed with the emotion that came from his note to Diet 
in which he shared the whole story is that even through his death, he would never have any regrets for having done the right thing. But then also there was always such a little package, this toilet paper, you did the <laughs> toilet paper. So you, you looked forward to getting the toilet paper, right? Yeah. The, the little thing with the and red from the Red Cross. Yeah. the toilet paper to write me his last note. And in it he wrote, and that made me... Th that isn't it, is it? Is that this the, was, yeah. That's the last this note from Hein? This is broken, I think. Yes. Yes. But I mean, in that he wrote, um, we are, and that's what made me so happy because he suffered so much. I think they did, maybe it was him with the nails, but he threw that paper out when he went to Dachau where he was killed. And it was found and it was sent to me. This is not the original. Okay, that's not the original that's one. That's with the government. Okay. But it said, please send on. And it was found and it was in an envelope and it was sent to my house and in it was, we will never be sorry for what we did. That's what he because, said. Because, yeah, in the face of death. Because you could think that when you have faced death, that you think, oh, goody, I should never have done this. But that made me so happy. That so, so Heinz, last note to you that was written on toilet paper from the Red Cross. That he loved me the most that he in the loved whole you. world. And that uh, we never would be sorry for what we did. Yes. And that God is in control. And I think somewhere, Paul says uh, that it's that you give your life for your friends, you know. That's that right. You have. That's right. And I thought, Hein even gave his life for enemies. He gave his life for enemies. You know, that's really also, right. That's right. Absolutely. Not only friends, but enemies too. Yes. Were, were any of the other people, obviously some of your other group in the underground were arrested. I mean, obviously Hein went to Dachau, you went to jail. How many of the underground people were caught? We were in total, if you also the outsiders, we were 13. Thir 13? 13. 13 in people group. in your group. And okay. eight were killed. And eight were killed. And the rest nearly all were in prison and in the camps. Okay, so the Gestapo eventually found them or whatever, and they arrested at least eight of the 13. You could walk in the street and you could be stopped and they searched you. Yeah. You had no... You could never be, so I was arrested with a lot of stuff here, but God did a miracle that I could rid of it, otherwise I would have been shot. Yeah, so finally that, that final day came, Deed, when you were arrested and you were taken to jail. And what was the first thing that went through your mind when, when they arrested you? I mean, you knew that maybe you were going to jail or maybe to die. What was going through your mind as a young you girl? You won't believe this. This is so <laughs> crazy. I was two years on the run. Two a years on the here, run, okay. Two nights there, a night here, and always with dangerous stuff. So I was always tense and never quiet. And when I, the door closed behind the cell, <laughs> at long last. I nearly felt relieved that at long last. So you were actually, in a strange way, relieved that you didn't have to run anymore? Yeah, that you and were then, just, of course, yeah. later, when that first really, because you expect it every day. Yeah. And then at long last, yeah, it had happened. Because wherever I slept, I always had to ask, how can I get out if at three in the night there's a knock at the door to the Gestapo? So can I get out over the roof or whatever? It was a nervous a life. A nervous life. So, so literally for two full years, you were going in the middle of the night from place to place, and you would talk to people and say, if the Gestapo comes, I uh, need to be able to I go. In the slept, but during the day, I had to bring all that stuff around because like I say, the, the Jewish people were not allowed to write each other. The, the neighbors said, hey, the mailman was there. What, what happened? Do you have somebody there? So we had to do the mail. I had to do every month with the robbery. Okay, so you had the ration cards and that you were also- That was my work. And you were also the mailman, right? And I right? walked, 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 walked the Netherlands, yeah. like from here to Muskegon or something. <laughs> So yeah, you're just walking, walking all the I time. I have walked so much, thousands yeah. of miles. Thousands of miles. Now, now the years. Dutch had a lot of bicycles, right? But you were walking mostly. Yeah, doing... because the Germans took, if you had a nice bike, I had five bikes and they took them all. So the Germans stole the bikes. If a the German bikes, was yeah. walking and you were on your bike, halt. And I nearly always had dangerous stuff. So I didn't, uh, give me your bike. And one time I had nothing. And so he wanted the bike and I said, no. And I wanted, and he took his revolver out, and he shot right next to my foot. What? And he said, you give me that bag, the next one goes in your foot. So what do you do? 
You give it. That's what the Germans said. And then I just got, like that. I mean, right in front of you, just shot right there. They did that, so he would have shot in my food. As I was listening to Diet share the story of her life during the Second World War and the fact that she spent really over two years, literally night and day, running from the Nazis as she was seeking to save Jewish people and to be a resistance person in the Netherlands, I was really struck with the concept of perseverance, the idea that because her belief in the Lord was so strong, her love for people was so wonderful, that this power inside of her helped her to persevere the worst circumstances and situation day after day for over two years. And it really stopped and made me reflect on my own life and about do I have that persevering love for the Lord and for others? Would I be willing to, over a period of two years, struggle and suffer for people, some of them that I didn't even know because of the Lord's love, would I be able to do that? And I think Deed Eamon really challenged me to think about that persevering love of God. You know, Deed, one of the things that is really on my heart, and I believe it's on your heart, are the young people. You know, we see our young people today, and what, were, what would be some things that you would want young people to think about today? Uh, maybe lessons in life that you've learned. What would you say to some young people today about what I the Lord... I always say that from the day you are born till the day you die, there is not one life that goes totally smooth. Yeah. And somewhere you get a heavy burden. Yeah. And it can be sickness, it can be that you are alone, it can be anything, but every life gets that. There is not one life. And then I would say, if that happens... Remember what Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. Right. And when I was arrested and I sat in that cell, they had not taken my bobby pin. And it was a brick wall, it was a horrible cell. But I scraped every day and there were four others in and they were good. So they looked at the spy hole in the door that there was no guard. And then I scraped and over the days and I embroidered that thing that under the blanket and later in the camp. But I wrote on that, Lo, I am with you always. And whatever yes. happens, you're never alone. Yeah. Because normally when you're sick or you have trouble, there is somebody who loves you, takes care of you or That's whatever. Right. But there was nobody. And that is very unusual because if you are sick or go through a divorce or whatever, your family and your loved ones are around you. But there was nobody, only yeah. God. And he was sufficient. Yeah, just, just, just to let the young, the young yeah, just to let the young people know that they're going to have trials in life. They will have it. They're going to have the trials coming, and that the Lord is always with them to always and carry also, that in their God heart. Never gives more than you can bear. Yes. that's another thing. Yes. So if you get a heavy load, then God gives also the strength to take it. Yeah. Because he does not give us more than we can bear. So that are two very important things. Very important things for young people to consider. And I really am amazed because I was thinking of the day I was arrested in the train. I had so many dangerous things. I would be shot. So you were, you were carrying, what were you carrying when they arrested you? What, for what, all what did stolen you, stuff. Okay, so you had all of this stolen stuff. In an envelope here. Envelopes all over and your body. And here I okay. am surrounded by five Gestapo guys. Yes, five Gestapo. And I was praying to God, Lord, this is my sure death. If it's possible, give me a chance to get rid of it. Yeah. And you say, humanly possible, with five people around you, it's not. And yeah. God did a miracle because the plastic had just found me out. Plastic, that's now so normal. Yes. But that had just been found out. And the tallest guy, he was far over six feet. He had a shiny gray military raincoat on. He had a big raincoat. And you know. at okay. that time, own, everything was gabardine, and if it was very rainy, it was soaking wet. Yeah. It yeah. And also, all the pockets were always in the gabardine here in the side seams. Yes. But this guy had a raincoat, shiny, and it had two big pockets here that had never been seen. Right in the front. Yeah. And so I hear, and I pretended I couldn't hear German, but I heard one say, is that that new material? Is this really waterproof? And the guy said, yes, it's waterproof. And I, we were standing on the station. I was arrested in the train, and they'd taken me out, and I had to go to the prison. So we were in Utrecht there mm -hmm. to take another train that would go to the prison. 
and we were standing there and old people were going up and down and up and down and I said, oh Lord, let me get a chance then I can throw it away. Then it can be anybody with hundreds of people walking up and right, down right. because the trains were packed and uh, there were so few trains. And, and then uh, I hear all of a sudden that one of the others said, is it really waterproof? Yes. And then <laughs> he said, and those big pockets, that is so nice. He says, yes. And he said, would you believe it? It has pockets on the inside. Now that is nowadays, it never happened. Yeah. On the inside, and this tall guy opens it up wide. All the heads went in, and there went my envelope. <laughs> now, isn't that amazing? That's amazing. I mean, to go into the new raincoat, all I of a sudden it goes that in. That morning, when that guy put on the raincoat, God must have smiled, and that was the salvation of my life. Right, because if they had caught you with all of those things, you probably would have been I, executed. I would have been shot right They away. would have just taken you and shot you. Because I had all the stuff stolen from their offices. Right, yeah. In terms of the people that you worked with, um, you know, did you think a lot of people, I mean, their faith grew tremendously during this time? Their faith in the Lord. Would you say that the people on the farms, the people in the resistance, your own faith, I mean, it had to be growing Every day, every second, you had to trust the Lord. But you know, it is the Netherlands, and we have stiff lips. So I mean, <laughs> they don't, yeah, they don't really talk about their faith. So they were kind of quiet they about it. it. Yes, okay. But they don't, and that has changed. And that's what I love about America, because in the Netherlands, you 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 did it, but you didn't talk about it. You didn't it. say anything. No. Yeah. And it's good that. I mean, the outsiders should see what you do out of love for to God. Yes, exactly. And sharing. You know, the thing that surprises me is that that period of two years when you were on the run before you were arrested, and literally almost how were you moving every other night? I mean, were you moving oh, regularly? Sometimes I stayed two days or three days. You stay two but to three I, days, yes. But that's what I love because David was on the run for Saul. Yeah. I felt I loved the Psalms of <laughs> David because... I felt the same, you know. So you were Lord, kind of how like, can you, do yeah, this? you were kind of like David <laughs> running from Saul. I mean, every day, every two or three days, you might move to another place. I love Psalm 27. Yeah. The Lord is my light and my salvation. And then later, he put me on a rock and he hid me in his tent. And yeah. that's what he literally did. With yeah. Me. So literally the Psalms and particularly David's life really came to life for you. You know, in an amazing way, because you really were a fugitive. I mean, in your own country, you were always on the run, trying to continue to hide. Did you find that some of the people um, were very scared to have you in their house? Uh, then they didn't take you. And they just they... wouldn't take you. So how did you how did you find people? I mean, you're on the run for two years. Well, how do you the find farmers, people? Farmers, you know, they knew each other, and if you say. I came at one address and I knew they were wonderful Christians. And they had said, because sometimes an address became dangerous and then we had to take mm -hmm. them out. But where do you then go? Because the people who were willing to take them had already. And I remember that they said, well, that couple is very Christian and go there because I was with a shaky case that, that I thought I have to take that guy out. And I went, no, we want nothing to do. And I was in my heart so angry. And I thought, how can you, as a Christian, say yeah. no? Later, yeah. I heard they had already Jews. <laughs> oh, they already had people there, yeah. some and of them, yeah. I was yeah. so young, I didn't even think of that possibility. Yeah. As I reflect on Deet's life and the amazing things that happened to her and how she saw the Bible come alive for her as she went through her trials and her suffering, I think that the deeper message, perhaps for all of us in listening to Deet, is that as we go through our life, whatever the challenges, whatever the struggles, there's gonna be a place in the Bible that's going to speak right to our situation. Diet's story and being on the run for over two years from the Nazis was very much as Diet reflected a story of David running from Saul. And I think that connection to scripture was something that gave her a sense of meaning and purpose and interpretive narrative to the things that she was going through. Right after the war, I was so angry with God because that was really, I there was a father of seven kids and the youngest were three, uh, five and seven and nine. And I had to be somewhere and he said, come on and sleep here. So it was like he had the house full, but there was a sh allied plane shot down and 
those guys, they didn't surrender. They hid in haystacks and pss, pss, pss. These are the pilots now yeah, that are coming the, for the, the air crews. British, yeah, you know, the British, and Americans. Uh -huh. And then they didn't want to go to a concentration camp. It was towards the end of the war. And then uh, I heard that, and they knew that I was in the underground. So they said, can you bring those pilots to that and that address? But on the, you were shot. You didn't even, even get a tra trial or anything. They would if shoot you, you right away. On the spot, you were shot. So it was very dangerous. But we felt, I felt especially, they are Americans. They could have stayed safe behind the Atlantic Ocean. And here they come. So I had to help. And then uh, they had beautiful uniforms and leather shoes, and there was nothing anymore. So we had to put them in rags and tatters, and the shoes had carton soles. So then I had to bring them, and it was very dangerous. And we had fall, and they couldn't speak. If the Germans stopped you, they couldn't speak. Not a Dutch. word of you know, no, right? They could yeah. only speak English. So that was very dangerous. And then this father, all of a sudden, there was a plane shot down, and there were four allies. And he took them in with he his took seven them in. kids. Yes. But those guys were speaking English to each other when we were eating. And the kids from five, seven, nine heard that. And that was the first time that the word OK that we heard that. You know, oh, it's OK. It's OK. That was it started in the war, that word. Before it was not, didn't exist. And so those kids go play outside. And they heard those pilots. And outside they were saying, well, they were playing OK, OK was a giveaway that there were allies. They knew that the allies had been yeah, staying in the house. They so wouldn't have said those words, I said right? to the father, you have to leave, and I don't sleep there anymore. The Gestapo will come here, because they were everywhere. And sure enough, so he hides at the farm. I went away, and I never went back there. And sure enough, the Gestapo came. And because they didn't find him, they took his wife, the mother of seven kids, to and these were the last days of the war. And the Allies flew over, and they were really the boss, you know, because yeah. the, the Germans didn't have planes anymore. They knew they were losing. And then, and that's always what I can't understand of God, and I was really angry. This father is hiding at the farm, and the Allies dropped a bomb, thinking somewhere that there was, that there was some bunkers or whatever, and it fell on that farm. And oh my the word. only one who was killed was the father of the seven kids. So, and you say, yeah. So why, God, why, why, I mean, why, why? What one of the greatest whys of your whole time in the war is this and father is killed, answer. hiding the allies, and his and the wife bomb was falls. taken because they came to arrest him and he wasn't home. So they took his wife to another city where, the, but they were losing the war. So then those seven kids, the youngest. So I went there and I had to take care of the household and everything. And I, but I was so upset when I heard that the father had been killed. And then they let uh, the other people also, they went to the headquarters of the Germans and they said, hey, there are seven kids alone. Can you please let that mo woman out? So th they were losing and they let her so out. So they let her out. So she they was able to be out. reunited with but her children. But then the next day we were liberated, so we were free. But I never can understand that God took that father of seven kids. Yeah. And then by the allies, you know, it's so painful. Yeah. You know, Deet, one of the things that you've shared a little bit is that it kind of bothered you to be a thief. You know, you had to steal these ration cards. How did you feel inside when you had to lie, you had to steal? As, as a Christian, as a believer, how, how did you deal with that? I had at one point really trouble with lying all the time. But when I was arrested, I had to lie yeah. my name. And then I, I was thinking of my hearing and what I had to say and whatever. And I couldn't tell the truth because then all the others would be arrested. Mm -hmm. and, I was, and then I thought of this story of Rahab, that she yes, hit Rahab, the spies on yeah. the roof. Okay. And that... She is in the ancestry of Jesus. So yes, she that's was right. For life. <laughs> she was not person. So I said, well, Lord, I... So, and now so, that I look back at all the evil, because at that time we didn't know how much evil they did. So I, that's yeah. just after the war that they had killed all the Jews. So I really felt bad. Now I don't feel bad anymore. Yeah. 
So you were kind of like a modern day Rahab, you know, you were, you were kind of hiding the spies. And in a way, this is interesting, Deed, in a way the Lord spared you. You know, he spared Rahab and he spared you. I mean, he, 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 Rahab was one of the few women who were in the ancestry of right, Jesus. Right, in the ancestry of Jesus. And she was a yes. prostitute and yes, she told right. a lie. A lie and the Lord <laughs> loved her. And, yeah, person. I know that's a really fantastic story. I was very moved in listening to what Deed had to do to save Jewish people and to help out the Jews during the Second World War as she involved herself in just about everything that went against her conscience. Surely she didn't want to lie and steal and cheat, but she felt the greater good and a love for the Lord and the love for the Jewish people and others compelled her to do things that in the end she never would have done ordinarily. And as Deet reflected on it and went to the story of Rahab in the Bible, one of the great stories about a woman who went ahead and lied and, and in a sense cheated her own people to hide the Jewish spies going into Jericho, I think Deet really gave us a perspective about sometimes the greater good is served by some of the things that we do that are even wrong. And I think that every Christian wrestles with some of these issues of ethics and how to handle situations that come our way. And I think Deet's story and her reflections on Rahab in the Bible gave me an understanding of how we have those templates in Scripture that we can look to when we face the difficult times and when we're looking for guidance and direction and how to serve our Lord, how to do the right thing, even when all of the ethics, all of the things that we're supposed to do are not so clear. Do, do you think people deet today are naive about evil? In other words, if you look at evil, you've seen evil as much as anyone that I've ever met in, in the world. Do you think people realize that evil is in the world? Do you think people are aware of it? I think the majority doesn't because they are not interested in the news and they don't see further than what they, there is much more behind everything yeah. with our government too. Yeah. I mean, there is such a lying, like... Yeah, so they're just, people IRS are not aware, and, yes, And everything. many things, and they yeah. don't cheat, and they don't seem to care. Yeah. So how can we expect a blessing from God? I mean, we are getting away from God here. Yes, so that's one of the biggest things you see, even in America, is the, that the we're moment. just moving, right now, we're moving away from the Lord. We have to very much out, yeah. because I have an article, what is an infidel, and anyway, that uh, explains what... And it said, well, we have to, they want to rule the world yeah. because for Allah, yeah. they mean good, but they are wrong. Yeah, they're wrong. You know, I think that many people just believe, believe that nothing like Germany and the Third Reich will ever come back. There'll never be evil that will come back like that again. As you look at, at life, do you think that, that there's going to be more evil coming someday? Well, it says in the Bible that in yeah. the end times. Yes. And sometimes I start thinking if we are the beginning of the end times. Yes. Because the, I think, you know, uh, uh, like now with the IRS, that they take the groups, as the con uh, let's say the conservatives, that they check those. I mean, that are little things, but it goes that way. D does this remind you some of this stuff of what was going on in, in the and Netherlands? It starts little, yeah. but it ends big. Now, that's like, an interesting statement. So everything always starts small, but then it gets big, right? It started small in the Netherlands, and then it got really big. Yeah. Listening to Deet Eamon share her, her amazing story during the Second World War as a leader of the underground, Deet reminded me that evil is all around us, but a lot of times we don't recognize it, we don't see it. And I think listening to Deet's story and watching her face and deal with evil every day is a reminder to us that we have to accept the reality of what we see around us. That we can't run and hide from me, but we have to look it right in the face and recognize that if we don't deal with it, if we don't face it in an honest, good, and real way, eventually the consequences are going to be terrible. And I think Deet really helped me not to be naive about evil, but to understand its reality and hopefully be discerning and willing to understand it, to face it, and deal with it for the blessings and help of others around me. Okay, Deed, I wanted to ask you a little bit about what happened here a few years ago. You have received an award that only a few people in the world have received. It is a, an award from Yad Vashem and from the people of Israel um, about being a, a righteous person among the nations. 
A and righteous Gentile. A righteous Gentile. Of <laughs> course, the, yeah, title. righteous Gentile. We are Gentiles because we weren't born Jewish. Dee, tell, tell us, what, what does that mean to you, to, to know the Lord used you and that you, you received this award? Can you share that with us? Well, I, of course, I'm happy because <coughs> I read that only people who have risked their lives get dealt that's for right. Shem. That's right. So it's a great honor. Yeah. And I love the Jewish people. And I have many Jewish friends. And when there are special days like the Holocaust Remembrance Day, I yes. always go to the synagogue because I think there. But you know, the other day they didn't even have a special service. And I yeah. think I told Rabbi Shadik, <laughs> I said, you should have a special service. So when you, when you received the award, did they give you something? Did you go someplace to get the award? How, how did that I happen? I had to go to uh, Illinois somewhere. Okay, so you went to Illinois. In a place, I it's all on the lake, and that is a place, a city or a village that is very Jewish, and I had to go there. And there's also a big wall with names engaged from people, and there is a pond, and it has, uh, it's all for people who gave, risked their lives for them, yes. for Yad Vashem. Yes. And I was invited to go to Israel, but I don't know, I, the, the top guy from the Jewish people came here to that place, yes. Evanston or something, Evanston. Evanston, Illinois, I, yeah. I, okay, that's where my that's father That's where was. I had to go, and yes. that's where a big wall, and it was a very wealthy Jew who paid for that. And there, the, yeah. the minister the, from, uh, the prime minister from Israel was there, and there were Polish people who were Jewish and who had suffered a lot, so. So it's really a very important day, obviously, in your life, and, and, and what a blessing to be able to have helped those people. There are only a few people in the entire world that ever received the Righteous Among the Nations Award that Deed Eamon received. And as we've listened to some of the stories about her life and some of the trials that she went through, it's really remarkable that the Lord used her in such a way to touch so many lives. I think ultimately receiving that award from the state of Israel for saving Jewish people at the risk of her own life ultimately speaks to me, I think as a Christian, about the sense that our Lord is watching our lives as well. And that as we go through trials and difficulties, maybe nothing like Deet went through, but things that are difficult and hard that our Lord is watching, that he is seeing the things that we do. And as the Lord Jesus himself promises many times in scripture, that even a cup of water given in his name will not lose its reward. You know, I think the exciting thing about Deet's life is she reminds us that we serve a wonderful Lord that one day will reward his people for all of the suffering, all of the trials, all of the things that we've gone through in his life. Deet received an award in this life from the state of Israel, but I think in a deeper way, something more wonderful is coming her for her one day when she meets our Lord. So Deet, when you are, are going out today, now you spoke at our church, you've spoken all over the world, really, to different groups, and you're still taking speaking engagements sometimes. What, are, what is maybe the, is there a couple of very important things that you would like people to know about your life and about what the Lord did? As well, when I look back, I think I have had heavy burdens yeah. over the years. But like I can say, I was never alone. Whatever yeah. happened, God was there. Yeah, the Lord was with you. And his grace is sufficient. Yes. And that is the only thing you can cling to in life. Yes. Well, I think that is a wonderful thing. And I think the other thing, too, is that you have inspired me because you want to be used by the Lord. You know, I think many Christians, you know, they retire or, or they, they stop doing ministry things. But even now, you want the Lord to continue to use you, don't you? But it said nowhere in the Bible that when you're old, you may sit on your butt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't find that in the Bible. So really, you get a joy, dear one serving the Lord Jesus, right? Just, it's just a privilege, and I see it on your face, just a joy to serve the Lord, yes? Yeah. I'm so happy that he's still willing to use me. He doesn't need me, yeah. but I may do it. That's right. So, so probably maybe your great joy at this season of your life is still to be used by the Lord 
to share something to be a help to others. Is that right? But I like to be needed. You, you know? like to be needed and also used by the Lord. I, I mean, think of all of the people that the Lord has used you to speak to. I mean, that must be something that gives you joy, yes? And like I say, when I was 16, I hope my life won't be dull. And I think, <laughs> Lord, I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, the Lord answered that prayer that your I life would never be boring. the nicest things, but it definitely wasn't dull. Yeah. You, as you look back over your life, Deet, are you surprised about your life? Yeah. You're I'm surprised just lately about it, yes. because I'm yeah. 93, so I know my days are numbered. And just the last couple of days, and I couldn't fall asleep till 2 o'clock and 2.30, yeah. I thought... What all happened in my life? And I go to my photo album and I see people that meant a lot and I can't remember their names yes, anymore yes. and where I met them and so yeah. on. So I have to, so that's where my memory Your memory fails. is going a little bit here. But I mean, I mean, to be this nice Dutch girl growing up in the Netherlands and to be talking here now to a pastor in America and all of the things that the Lord has done in your life to bring you here is really uh, amazing and to me. South America and where South I spent America, 10 years and also speaking of course in, in other places in the world just to be amazed at the Lord you know like Lord how did I get here I asked you know? for a life no yeah. dull and I yeah. think no Lord you moment. have given it to me and not always I forgot to say and only nice things please yeah and only nice things <laughs> but too no life is only nice things so yeah. and that's what I tell people young people too you expect that the, you will sometimes get a heavy burden. Yeah, sometimes the heavy burden will come, but always to remember that the Lord that will always be with you. But that is when you get closer you. to God. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I do as a pastor every Sunday in my church is I get up and talk about living by faith. But what does that really mean? I, I think my time with Deed had a profound effect on me of what it really means to live by faith is to literally be facing death every day and yet have the inner strength, courage, and faith in the Lord to somehow carry you through. I've been just thrilled to have this connection with Deed Eamon and to really learn a little more about what it means to live by faith and to see that throughout her life, her life became a story really of what it means to live by faith. I think that Deed's life also teaches us something very important that I think every one of us as Christians needs to think about today. And I think it's the story that ultimately history will repeat itself. I think Deed was very aware that the patterns that she went through during the Second World War, the rise of evil, uh, the way in which evil operated in the Netherlands, levels of anti-Semitism and other things that she saw, that these patterns, even though they happened here 60, 70 years ago, that those patterns in history are still things that we need to realize can come our way again. So I think my time with Deed is a reminder that history can and will repeat itself, but it's also a great challenge to me as a Christian to really think about what am I doing right now as a believer to make a difference in the world? to be discerning about the things in my culture and society that I need to be thinking and praying about. And also, how can myself as one person, like Deet, be used to really influence many other people? And so for me, meeting Deet was one of the great inspirations of my life. And I hope as you've listened to Deet's story, that lessons from her life will be used by the Lord to be a part of your life. And that as we follow in the footsteps of our Lord and live our life by faith day to day, that other people will be affected, will be blessed, and will be influenced to the glory of God and of his kingdom forever.